Praise God. Please be seated. Very good morning, everyone. Merry Christmas. It's December. Help me tell someone beside you, Merry Christmas. As you can tell by, by all the beautiful lights we have around the building, and uh, if you saw our worship leader's t-shirt this morning, Christmas tree and all, yeah, it's, a, it's a nice Christmas season to be in. And I think it's always a, a great season. And I just want to quickly pause and, and thank everyone for your prayers for the Christmas Magic team. Um, like like uh, Shami was mentioning, quite a number of them have been falling sick, including um, uh, my, uh, my mom. I think she's, she's still sick, but we pray that she will recover in the name of Jesus. Um, before that, um, my niece Hannah was sick. Chrysler was sick. Chrysler was sick and still doing the shows as well. And then when my brother-in-law Frank was up there, he also fell sick. So, and a lot of the cast and crew are, are falling sick as well. So do continue to keep them in your prayers. And I just want to say on behalf of my family, we're very thankful for all your prayers. And well, this morning, I'm, I'm delighted to be in the house of the Lord. I just feel a sense of joy here. Do you all feel happy to be in the house of the Lord? Yes, yes over there at Suntech, I know you guys feel happy to be in the house of the Lord as well. I, feel, I don't know, I feel, I feel happy, I feel kind of nostalgic, you know, because uh, Charmaine is introducing me. I think it's the first time she's doing that at the main service, but it's kind of like, it's, it's um, because when, when we first started Teens Excite, I was the preacher and she was always introducing me, so it's kind of like what happened about um, what, seven years ago. So it's really, it's really fun. But as we're here in this Christmas season, just a quick reminder, we're going to continue in our sermon series going through the fruit of the Spirit. And like I've been explaining to us and the different preachers have been explaining to us, we deliberately reverse the order so that as we come into this end of the year season, this month of December, we're talking about forbearance, peace, joy, and love. I mean, these are things that really are the message of Christmas. And so last week, Pastor Weelong, he taught us about forbearance. And he talked about how as we come to this time of Christmas, you know, many families, we gather together, uh, friends, they come together. It is a time where we come and remember relationships but yet many of us have broken relationships and therefore he says we must learn to bear with one another in love and today I think it's a great continuation of that because the sermon I have for all of us this weekend is entitled Peace. That is the next part of the fruit of the Spirit we're going to be talking about and like I said, this peace that we have will be the evidence to the world that we are disciples of Jesus Christ. The world is looking out there and they must see this peace that is within us. Let's come back and look at what it says in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23. It says this, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now, the beauty of Scripture, and as we go through this sermon series, what, what I've come to appreciate at, at, at an even greater level, is how all these different aspects, they tie in with one another. You can't have one without the other. It's like how it talks about, like, as we, the more we talk about self-control, the more I realize it's important that to, be, to exercise self-control, we must be gentle. We must be kind. You know, and similarly for us to bear with one another in love, we must exercise self-control, and everything basically is interconnected. And today's sermon, peace, is interconnected with everything as well, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But before we start, why don't we join our hearts together for a word of prayer? So let's come and pray. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this fantastic time we can gather together as a family. We know that this is your season. We want to glorify you. We want to honour you. Lord, truly we ask that this morning, Glory to God in the highest. We ask for you to come and rule and reign. Holy Spirit, come and lead us, come and guide us, speak to us, and, and come and move among us. We commit this time into your hands. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. So today we're going to be talking about the next aspect of the fruit of the Spirit, which is peace. And I think peace is something important to talk about. Peace is something we discuss a lot about, especially in the Christmas season. You know, we talk about uh, 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 goodwill to all men and peace on earth. And we, we talk a lot about it, and we all want peace. I think if I ask all of us here, how many of us want peace? All of us will say, we, we want a life of peace. And there's so much talk about peace, so many discussions about peace all around the world, but yet, somehow, peace seems to elude us. I was reading this New York Times article. It was an article that was written back in 2003. And it's, it's an insightful article, but yet it's, it's kind of interesting. It says this, Of the past 3,400 years, humans have been entirely at peace for 268 of them, or just 8% of recorded history. 
Think about that. Just 8% of recorded history is said to have been times of peace. But you know what gets really funny about this article? I'm not here to pick on this article. Like I said, it's very insightful for me. But yet there's something I found quite amusing. Is that this, this, this article defines what war is. And the definition of war as written in this article is this. A conflict where more than 1,000 people lose their lives. That is the definition of war. So as I sit back and I look at it, just saying out of 3,400 years, 268 years are at peace. But based on your definition, it means that in these 268 years, there could have been conflicts where people, where less than 1,000 people died, but we don't count that as a war. And that doesn't quite make sense to me. But in the, what, the point I'm trying to make is this. Peace seems to be something that eludes us. No matter what, we can't seem to grasp peace. And I'm not here to talk about how everything is so bleak, but let's face it, human beings are no strangers to war. Let's go to any school, go to any secondary school, pick up a history textbook and thumb through the history textbook. What do you find? We find studies on wars and histories of wars, and we read about conflicts and turmoil in countries. That is the truth. The truth is that there is a lack of peace. You know why? You know why war is something that happens all the time? Why, is it, why does it take place so frequently? Well, I want to tell us something. It's because peace is something that does not come to us naturally. Peace does not come to you and I naturally. We are not naturally created, uh, in a sense, not, not that we're not created. Our essence, our being, always tends to bring about conflict. Let's, let's ask ourselves, in our lives, have we not been in conflict with people before? Have we not felt jealous of someone before? Have we not th thought evil thoughts or bad thoughts about other people? Well, it's because the Bible tells us that all of us are sinful. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, I know every time I say this, every time a preacher says this, I have, I have personal friends who hate it when I say that who hate it when I say that people are inherently sinful. They inherently have evil in them. They don't like it. Especially all my friends who are, who are not believers. They say, oh no, that's, 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 that's terrible. You know, you Christians have such a, a bleak outlook of life. You know what? Let me clarify that. I'm not saying that all we do as human beings is that 110% of the time we're just thinking of evil. We're trying to do evil. We're trying to do bad things. No one, none of us here, we wake up today thinking, well, how many people can I murder? How many people can I, can I kill? We don't wake up thinking that way. But what we're trying to say is this. I believe that human beings, we have great potential for good. But at the same time, we have great potential for evil as well. Let's look at the evil in human history. Who was responsible for all that evil? Wars, deaths. Who was responsible for that? Human beings. Us, we are responsible for, responsible for that. So we have that nature within us. But today, what I want to tell us is that peace, peace is not something natural to us because it is something supernatural. True peace comes from God and God alone. It is not something attainable through human methods. Peace is not something that can be created by a treaty, by an agreement, by some memorandum of understanding. All these things do not create peace because true peace comes from God and God alone. That's why we're, we're reminded in Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit is peace. When we have been filled with the Holy Spirit, when we keep in step with the Holy Spirit, that is when we actually can have peace. Without that, we don't have true peace. And today, I want to tell all of us here, you remember this sermon series is about evidence, it's about checking ourselves to see, am I demonstrating what it means to be a Christian? It's important because if we truly are Christians, if we truly are disciples of Jesus Christ, we will live lives that demonstrate true peace, God's peace. We will have that peace inside of us and we will make peace with the people around us. A man by the name of Henry Blackaby, he makes a statement, the Christian needs to walk in peace. So no matter what happens, they will be able to bear witness to a watching world. That is what it's all about. And so today, I want to read to us uh, uh, two passages of Scripture. It's not very long, just a couple of verses, only three verses only. Uh, one from the book of John and then two verses from the book of Philippians. Let's turn to John chapter 14, verse 27. And these are the words of Jesus Christ. He says this, Peace 
I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And then in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 to 7, a famous verse we know, it says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, why did I pick these two passages? Because these two passages show us what peace is. Is. And I'm going to share with us two things. These are not the two main points. You can jot this down somewhere just as your own notes. But two things we can learn. Number one, okay, the first thing we must understand about peace is that peace is a gift. Peace is a gift. God's peace is a gift. In John chapter 14, what, is, what did Jesus say there? He says, peace I leave, leave with you. My peace I give you. Peace is a gift. Number two, God's peace is supernatural. It's supernatural. It's not something of this world. It's not something natural. It's something supernatural. Why? Because as we look at Philippians 4, 7, it says the peace that what? The peace that makes sense to all of us, right? No, it doesn't say that. It says the peace that transcends all understanding. The peace that transcends all understanding. So these are the two things. You just jot it down. Number one, God's uh, God. True peace is a gift. Number two, true peace is supernatural. We must understand it. We must jot that down because that forms our framework and our understanding of what peace is. Now, I want to bring us to what our understanding of peace is. If you open a dictionary, you will find this definition of peace. Peace is defined as this, the absence of or the freedom from conflict, from turmoil or disturbances. Or if they use one word to define peace, they will use the word tranquility. There's a lot of truth here, but I think we need to go beyond that. We're going, to, we're going to come back to this later on. But today, I want to share with us that there are two aspects of peace that we must have in our lives. What are these two aspects? Let me share with you these two things now. There is, number one, a peace within. We must have a peace within. It's peace within ourselves. It's, on a, it's an inner kind of peace. And number two, there's also a peace without. A peace without means a peace that exists on the outside. If, if peace within is inner peace, then peace without is outer peace. The peace that we maintain, the peace that we make with the people around us. So let me explain to the, uh, these two points one by one. Number one, like I'm saying, the first aspect is that there is a peace within. There must be a peace within us. What did Jesus say in John chapter 14, verse 27? He says this, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. See, when Jesus talks here, he's addressing our inner state, he's addressing our inner being. You see, when he, when, when he says it, when he says, do not let your hearts be troubled, what does he mean? Does he mean that I pray that you won't have a heart attack, that your heart will be strong, your heart will not... No, he's not, that. He's not talking about it physically. He's saying that your heart, your inner being, your emotions, your thoughts, your spirit will not be one that is troubled. See, the truth is this, that in life there are many things that try and rob us of this peace within, this inner peace. If peace is the absence, okay, if our definition of peace is the absence of conflict, it is the absence of disturbances, it is the absence of turmoil, then peace is when we don't have any of those things inside our hearts. It's when our hearts have no conflict, there's no turmoil in our hearts, there's no stress, there's no anxiety, there's no worry. But let's face it, don't we live in a life full of anxiety, full of conflict? I'm sure many of us, we, you know, the interesting thing is this, why peace within is something important to talk about is because many of us, we don't actually, we, I mean, we, we fight with people, but we don't actually get into physical fights. We don't actually come to blows. We don't actually hit the other person or try and strangle the other person. We want to, but we don't actually do it, all right? But the issue is this. We, get, we don't physically fight, but we get into disagreements. We get into arguments. We start shouting each other. We start yelling each other. We start saying things that we shouldn't have. And what happens? These things stir up emotions in you. You either become hurt or you become angry and so on and so forth. And, and at night, you're trying to sleep. 
You're trying to rest. But all you can think about, all that's welling up within you is your anger towards this person or the pain that you have felt from what that person says. What is that? That is pain and anger robbing you of that peace. It is robbing you of that peace that should be within you. Sometimes we're not focused on that. Maybe sometimes we're stressed out at work. We have anxiety and we can't sleep at night. What is the anxiety doing? The anxiety is robbing us of peace. That's why we can't sleep. That's why the Bible says, do not be anxious. See, we must understand that there are so many things that are trying to rob us of our peace. The question is this, what are we, what are we going to do in those moments? Jesus says that it is a matter of our heart. And He says this, do not let your heart be troubled. And I, I, I want to think about this, you know. He says this, do not let your heart be troubled. Let this phrase be etched into your mind because it is very different from what many people want to hear. Jesus says this, do not let your heart be troubled. He never said this, let your life be free from trouble. Right? Two different things, right? Understand two different phrases. Between saying, do not let your heart be troubled versus let your life be free of trouble. Two very different phrases. In fact, the latter phrase, Jesus never ever said. Why? Because he said in John chapter 16, verse 33, I have told you these things. In fact, he discussed all the grief that people will go through. And he says, so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. See, that is what it's all about. It is an inner peace that we must have, a peace that is within us. Let's come back to the definition of, that I showed of peace once again. You know, I just said this, peace is the absence of or freedom from conflict, turmoil, or, or disturbances and tranquility. Now, I put this down because there are many different understandings of, of peace, but I like the definition that talks about freedom because freedom brings it one step beyond absence. See, sometimes we think that peace is the absence of conflict, but I think a better way to describe it is freedom from. Freedom from anxiety, freedom from, from, from trouble, freedom from uh, all these different things that affect us. Now, when you say that you're free from something, there are two possibilities, okay? There are two possibilities. One is that that thing doesn't happen to you. That's one understanding. Number two, it is that you're free from the effects of that thing. Let me explain it. For example, if I say I'm free from trouble, one possibility is that my life never has any trouble. I'm free from trouble. The, a deeper understanding though, it means this, my life may have trouble, but I'm free from that. I don't let it affect me. I don't let it destroy me. I don't let that trouble rule over my life. These are both what it means to be free from conflicts, free from turmoil, free from all these troubles. And that is so important because that is what Jesus says. Jesus never said that you will have a life free from trouble. He said we will have a life filled with trouble, but despite that, in spite of all those troubles, all that persecution, all that, that, that destruction, we can still find that peace. You know, I want you to think about, for, about this for a moment. What is it that robs you of that peace within? What robs you of that peace within? Is it a past hurt that you're always thinking about? Or is it hurtful words? Or is it uh, some anger issue, something that makes you upset? What, what robs you of that? Can I tell you something? I don't know what your expectation is. Some of us, our expectation is this. Oh, God, there are all these things that rob me of, of, of peace. And so what do we do? We say, oh, I want to go to an encounter. I lay it down before the cross. I nail it to the cross, everything. Well, then you'll never bug me again. I come to the altar, pastor, pray for me, and I'll have peace with this for, for the rest of my life. I'll never encounter this. You know what? Whatever you think about, those things that rob me of your peace, can I tell you something? Chances are these things will be with you for the rest of your life. What is one thing that robs me of my peace? Driving. We laugh about it, we talk so much about it, but I kid you not. In fact, one of, one of, one of, one of my, my chops said, Pastor, can we honestly put it in prayer tower to pray for you when you are on the road? Because, I, I mean, I, I, have a, I have a lot. I have, I have two cameras on my car. I like to pull out the recording and look. The amount of things that happen to me on the road is, is, is incredible, one, you know, okay? Especially when I'm driving uh, 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 to church. So funny, last week, last week Pastor Wee Long preached about forbearance, right? And he talked about driving as well. 
Okay, and, and on, on Sunday, we're driving, and then, and then Serene turns, and we're driving, and Serene looks at me and says, well, you know, today you stare at a lot of people on the road already. You know, and I was like, okay, I need to learn this sermon, but I will get cut off even today on the way here. I can some kind of weird drivers. Yesterday, I was coming, I was coming to, to church, and a lot of um, yeah, people were cutting me off. And, and just the other day, right, just the other day, I was trying to filter, I was trying to change lane, and I changed lane with a lot of excess space, you know. So I already start changing lane. I drift into the lane, right? I mean, I signal everything. I'm very quiet when I signal. Five seconds first, right? Then you start going in. I go into the lane. As I start entering the lane, this car from, from, from behind, okay, of a particular make and model, which is very famous for what they do, one, okay? He speeds up, you know, okay? He speeds up and tries to stop me from, from merging into the lane. So I, I drive further, and then I go into the lane, and then I, I merge, and then we went into a, we went into a tunnel. La. We went into the tunnel. This guy speeds up to my right. He overtakes me, and he makes a gesture with his finger to me, and then he drives off. I, had, I was that close from stepping my accelerator and, and go and chase uh, 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 the fellow, okay? But forbearance, forbearance. So, so uh, not good for my testimony last week, you know, and worked with Pastor Wee Long on his sermon, forbearance. This week, come and preach about peace, then in the middle of the week, chasing people and, 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 and doing all that kind of stuff. But you know what? This issue of me and, and my, my, my struggle with anger, okay, and, and irritants on the road, it's, it's been with me ever since I started driving. So many years already. It's never gone. But you know what? I got to learn how to let that not affect me? What good is it to me if I just, if, if, what good to me, if, what good does it do me to, to say one day, oh God, I never got angry on the road before. But the reason you never got angry is because nothing ever presented this opportunity for you to be angry. What makes a testimony is this, when yes, it is well within your rights to be angry, you can have all the most upsetting things, but you say, no, I will choose peace. That is what Jesus is talking about. He's telling us to be free from all that. See, we must be free from the effects of these things. See, this may seem weird, but that's why I said at the start, peace is a gift and peace is supernatural. If you want to put it together, peace is a supernatural gift. Why I say peace is a supernatural gift? Because Jesus says that. In John chapter 14, verse 27, what did Jesus say? Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. I do not give to you in a worldly understanding. Again, then what he says, what does he say in Philippians? He says, the peace that transcends all understanding. It is not a concept that we understand. Because to us, our human understanding is, I want peace. I, I, I want peace in my life. When I have peace in my life, it means that there will never be any trouble. That is not how peace works. At least according to the Lord. According to the Lord is this. You will have all that trouble, but in that trouble you will find peace. You know, in, you remember in, in um, I'll share with you two other passages, just briefly run through. You remember Matthew, Matthew 6? Matthew 6, there is a whole passage there that Jesus talks about not worrying. He says, do not worry about what you have to eat, what you have to drink. Do not worry about the clothes you have to wear. And he ends off this, but seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So that's, that's, that's an important aspect of this whole passage. Do not worry. And sometimes people say, oh, but easy to say, lah. don't worry about this and, 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 and all that. You know, we have, this, we have to understand this passage, you know, if you really study it properly in Matthew chapter 6. In Matthew chapter 6, when Jesus says, do not worry, right? Do not worry about what food you have to eat. It doesn't mean that, wow, well, you just float around and you just wait for food to appear, okay, and, 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 and all that. No, if anything, in that passage, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 32, Jesus says this, your heavenly Father knows that you need them. He knows your needs. He knows what you need in your life. And you, are, you can underline the passage, it's, it's something important. He knows what we need, but He's saying despite all your needs, despite all your troubles, despite all your worries, will you choose to receive His supernatural gift of peace? Remember, remember in... Um, Mark chapter 4. In Mark chapter 4, there is this passage where Jesus was on a boat with the disciples, then they went out on the Sea of Galilee, and in the Sea of Galilee, they encountered a storm. Now, the, the interesting thing is, is that I like what the Bible says. The Bible says that when they went out onto the waters, they encountered a storm. Now, the Bible says that the storm was called a squall. 
you know, you know a squall, S-Q-U-A-L-L. A squall, if you go and check the dictionary, it is defined as a furious storm. But if you look at the, I think it's, the, it's, it's in the NIV, it says this, that, he, that there was a furious squall. Think about it. Squall already means a furious storm. So what is a furious squall? It's a furious, furious storm. It's so furious, they're going to say furious twice. They went through this, this huge storm, and of which, if you've ever been to the Sea of Galilee, or if you know, if you've ever seen, the, the Sea of Galilee, it's, it's a lake, basically, but because of its geographic location, it has very abrupt storms. Sudden storms can suddenly appear out of nowhere. And so people already knew that. But they went out onto the water, and they went into this storm, and the storm was, was everything was going crazy. It was a very big storm. The, the water is coming out on the boat. Okay? And then remember... What's the most beautiful part about this, about this uh, uh, account? What was Jesus doing? He was sleeping. But the Bible doesn't just say he was sleeping. He was sleeping on a pillow. He was sleeping on a cushion. He got comfortable. He was, he was, he was enjoying himself lying on that pillow. And he slept despite that huge storm. Meanwhile, what were the disciples doing? They were panicking, running about. And the disciples ran up to Jesus and they said, in my opinion, one of the most accusing statements ever. Remember what they said? They said, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Why did they say, don't, we care if you, don't you care if we drown? It's basically like saying, it's basically a lack of trust. That's why Jesus says, do you still have no faith? They're not trusting Jesus. And as this happens, Jesus stands up and he rebukes the winds and the wave and everything calms down. Now, as we look back at this whole instance, you know what? Does it make sense what happened? If we encounter a storm, what will we do? We will be like the disciples. Right? We'll be panicking. We'll be trying to fix the situation. We'll be looking, wow, oh, the storm's coming. We've got maybe got a bit more time to, before the, the, the eye of the storm is here or whatever. You know, we, we'll be panicking. We'll be thinking about all that. But what was Jesus doing? Jesus was sleeping. You know, this reminds me of this song that I used to sing in, in Sunday school. It's called, With Christ in the Vessel, We Can smile with christ in the vessel we can smile at the storm smile at the storm got actions on my smile at the storm right okay have you ever thought about that song think about that song for a moment do you know how weird that song is do you know how much that song actually does not make sense how many of us will smile at the storm i'm pastor Willong's not here he's, he's running an encounter weekend but ask him he's a sailor do they smile wow storm coming shook ah I mean, how many of, of us, when you encounter storms in your life, wow, yes, storm, come, come at me, man. I, I love it. Just, just come and attack me. We don't, we don't do that. How many sailors actually live that way? They don't. But here, and, and I like, as, as kids, we learn, we, we learn this song, right? Okay? If we have Christ in the vessel, we can, and we say smile, right? We must do this action. Like, like, it's, a, like it's, a, it's a gigantic smile, you know? Like, you, that's creepy, you know? Okay? It's like, it's like, oh, the storm's coming, but you're... And, and, and I don't know, but if, just imagine that boat out on the Sea of Galilee and everybody's panicking, okay? And maybe all the other sailors are panicking, but you see Jesus' disciples, they're at the front of the boat. <laughs> if people look at that, you know what they're going to say? These people are weird, you know. That doesn't make sense. These people are crazy. You want to see how long I okay? But that's why we read in Philippians 4, 6, 7, do not be anxious about anything. But what? The peace, again, the peace that what? The peace that transcends all understanding. It doesn't make sense because this peace is not a natural peace. It's not an earthly peace. It's a supernatural peace. It transcends all understandings. That's why we can smile at the storm. But of course, there will always be struggles. There will always be difficulties. You know, I came across this um, um, quote by a man by the name of Thomas Watson. He says this, If God be our God, He will give us peace in trouble. When there is a storm without, He will make peace within. The world can create trouble in peace, but God can create peace in trouble. That's what peace within is all about. Peace within is something you either have or you don't have. It does not matter what is going on around you. But when you receive that supernatural gift, you will always have it. And no matter what, you can smile at the storm. 
But I want to tell us something. You know, we, we do struggle. I'm not saying that it's easy. I'm sure all of you have your own storms. I don't know what your storm is. I'm not saying it's, it's easy. I'm not saying that it's not going to be painful. There will be struggles. But you do not have to let those things overwhelm you. Just remember, we look back at the story of Jesus being in the boat and the storm. What happened? Jesus was the one who told the disciples to get in the boat. And as he says this, before they even enter the storm, he said, let's get in the boat and let's go to the other, the other side. He had a destination in mind for them. He was bringing them somewhere. And Jesus has a destination for each and every one of us. But on that journey, storms will come. And there's something interesting, okay? Uh, uh, one of my, my guys pointed this out to me last night. Among the disciples, they were seasoned fishermen. And they were locals. They, they, they would have known the conditions of the Sea of Galilee. But yet the storm was so big that they were panicked. They were afraid. Because the truth is that in life, we will eventually come, there will come a time where a storm hits us. A storm that we will never be prepared for. A storm, I don't know of what magnitude, but we are just not prepared to handle it. And all these disciples, they panic. But at the end, Jesus gets up, he rebukes the winds and the waves, and in some of the Bible translations, I like what it says. What did Jesus speak? What did Jesus say? Jesus looked at the winds and the waves, and he said, peace, be still. And I like to think about it, you know. You know, we, I, I, I don't know, like, I, I always tell you, I, I'm very imaginative when I read, read the Bible. I kind of see everything, you know. Um, I try to imagine what's happening. So I, I can just imagine, it's, it's very dramatic, you know, the, the boat is being tossed about, and Jesus gets up from his, his slumber, and they bring him to the, uh, he goes up to the front of the, of the boat, and he stands up there, and he looks out there, and it's all dark, and there's lightning and everything, and he says with this big, rumbling, authoritative voice, Peace, peace, peace. Peace, peace, peace. Be still, be still. I mean, that's, that's how I read the Bible. That's what, that's what I, I think is going on. But think about it, you know. Just think about it. Yeah. Does the storm have ears? Is the storm a living thing? What, why is he talking to the storm? Maybe he wasn't talking to the storm, you know. Have you ever, have you ever tried to hint something to someone and then you speak a little louder? Okay? Like, you know, you know, you, someone, someone came back from the drink store and bought a drink, and then you kind of see that, hey, the guy got a drink, I don't have a drink. And then you kind of like, well, if only someone would buy me a drink. You know? And you kind of like, you're trying to hint to that, that person. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, Jesus was hinting to the disciples that you need to be at peace. You need to be still. Yes, the storm is big. The storm has, it, it, it feels like it's going to overwhelm you, but it says you can learn to be at peace. You can learn to be still. You must receive this gift, this supernatural gift of peace within. So that's the first part I want to talk about. Now let's move on to the second thing. More than just having peace within, we must talk about having peace without Peace without is peace on the external. And how it takes, how it manifests in our lives is us making peace with the people around us. See, in the end, peace is about relationships. That's why we talk about, you know, if you're at war, means you're fighting against each other. If you're at peace, means you're working uh, uh, together. But somehow in the church, the word peace has somehow ended up in this state where it's, it's become very myopic. It's become very self-centered. Why? Because what, just, just let's, let's, come, let's put ourselves in a, in, in a church setting, in a worship setting. If we come to church here, and the pastor, or the worship leader, or whoever's here, or maybe you're at cell, or whatever, or maybe someone's praying for you, and that person says, I just feel that the Lord wants to bless you with peace. What do you immediately think of when he says that? He says, oh, the Lord wants to bless me with peace. And you, we kind of think it's a, wow, like this, like something comes over us, you know, like, wow, the Lord throws this blanket called peace over you, and this peace comes over you, and you, <sighs> wow, I feel at peace. I came in, I was, I was very anxious, I was, I, was, I was full of anxiety when I came into church, but now the pastor said, you're going to bless me at peace, and suddenly, <sighs> wow, I'm at peace. That's one part of peace, you know, but peace cannot revolve around yourself. Peace does not exist for one person. One person alone, what's the point of having peace by yourself? We have peace 
so that we can enjoy healthy relationships and strong relationships with other people. And that's one important aspect of the Bible that we must talk about, and sometimes we forget about that in the church. Maybe when the pastor says, I want to bless you with peace, it's not just about, wow, shook, I receive peace. Maybe it's about this. If the pastor says, I want to bless you with peace, it means right now, get out of your seat, go out, find all the people that you have offended or people that have offended you, and you make peace with them. Do we ever consider that? Sometimes we forget about that. But when we talk about peace, there is this important aspect. We talked a lot about John chapter 14, verse 27 so far, about Jesus saying, you know, my, my peace I give to you. Now, in those whole, all those passages there, in those number of chapters there, it happened on the night that Jesus was betrayed. It happened on the Passover uh, uh, night. It means that when they were gathered there at the Last Supper, Jesus told them, peace I give to you, my peace I leave with you. Why did he do that? There was something that happened on the night that Jesus was betrayed among the disciples. What happened? Let's look at Luke chapter 22, verse 24. On that night, it says, a dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. The disciples were arguing amongst themselves, trying to figure out who is better, who is greater. I mean, how does that even happen? Can you just put yourselves in the shoes of Jesus Christ for a moment? Okay, we're there having the Last Supper. Now, the Last Supper was a celebration of the Passover. It's a celebration of God's faithfulness. It's, it's, a, it's a big celebration for the Jewish people. It's like a big family celebration for us. Like the Chinese is like Chinese New Year, like that. All right? And, you know, these kind of celebrations, it's meant to be a time of reunion, coming together as a family. But then what do they do? They start fighting among themselves. Sounds like Chinese New Year, actually, you know, quite, can be quite, quite the case. But how does this even happen? Jesus is there. He has this Passover. He, you know, does everything that we do in the Lord's Supper. He said, this is my body broken for you. This the new covenant in my blood. He prays over them. Um, uh, what else happens? Then he says this. Okay, he's been telling them that he's going to have to leave them soon. He's going to die. And he says, someone is going to betray me. And after he says that, what happens to the disciples? They all start trying to figure out who is going to betray him, which I suppose is a very normal response. But shortly after they do that, they end up fighting about who is the greatest. Suddenly from from focusing on that, the fact that Jesus is going to be betrayed, suddenly they're looking at themselves, you know. Well, you know, we're going to, and, and who's greater? I, I don't even know how that evolves into this conversation, you know. Well, Jesus, someone's going to betray you. Oh, must be you, lah. must be you, lah. Peter, you're very lousy, you're not, blah, 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 blah. Start arguing, uh, then start arguing until, yeah, lah, because you, you should sure, you sure betray Jesus, one, because you're so stupid, lah, blah, 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 blah. Then you start arguing, and it becomes this thing about who's better, who's the greatest. This, this, I, I, do, I, I mean, if, just imagine if you were Jesus, what would you do? You just stand there and shake head. Lah. Like, wow. like, what's going on with these people? And so what he saw there is that there is a breakdown relationship. They're fighting. Fighting over stupid things. Fighting over things that don't really matter. And that's why he says they must have peace. That's why he says, I better leave them my peace. If I don't give them this gift of peace, wow. Xiao Leo. They're going to be fighting for the rest of their lives. And so I need to give them this gift. In fact, if you recall, in John chapter 16, it records Jesus' prayers that night. And Jesus makes this one important prayer in John chapter 16. He says, my prayer for them is that they would be one. My prayer is that they would be one. See, what I'm trying to highlight here is this, that peace is so important. Peace with one another is important. It's on God's heart. And, how, and, when, and in fact, when we look at the fruit of the Spirit, when we look at Galatians chapter 5, one important aspect or one even, in fact, maybe the key aspect of that passage is that the peace is talking about there. It's not just this, this inner peace. It is about making peace with the people around us. How do we know that? You see, when we study Scripture, we must study it in the context of the entire passage or in, in a bigger context. The one, 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 we have one very, one, one good benefit Okay, when we study the fruit of the Spirit, okay, or one key handle that is there, is that we don't have to, we don't have to pull out a lot of different things. The Scripture itself gives us a good explanation. What, what am I talking about? I'm talking about this. Before we talk in verse 22 about the fruit of the Spirit, verse 19 tells us something else. Okay, we have the fruit of the Spirit, but before that we have the what? The desires, the lust, or the acts of the flesh. So here you have an op opposing comparison already. And if we look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 19, it says this, the acts of the flesh are obvious. 
sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft. And listen to this. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, and so on and so forth. Listen to all these words that I've emphasized, all these words that I've highlighted. It's because of these words that we can understand, and many biblical scholars, they teach that the peace that Galatians 5 talks about is making peace with one another. That's why we're talking about how the acts of the flesh are hatred, jealousy, discord. Discord is is basically disunity, dissension, factions. It's talking about being divided and being split. That's why we must understand this important aspect of peace. And it's consistent throughout Scripture. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 to 15, it says, Make every effort to live in peace with everyone. Say everyone. Everyone. Say it like you mean it, everyone. everyone. It means that person you don't like, that person you cannot stand, that person that irritates you to no end. Maybe that person's right beside you right now, but it means everyone. Tell the person beside you, I will make peace with you. (laughs) It says, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 2 to 3. Last week, Pastor William taught us about this. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. What is the bond of peace? What does that mean? Look at, look at the New Living Translation. It says this, Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. Binding yourselves together. What does it mean to be bound together? If I bind you with a rope, what does it mean? It means I tie you up with that rope. And so this one says, we are to be bound to one another with this rope called peace. To be bound to one another means this, you know, the, the person is, I, I, I hope it's the person that you like, honestly. Uh, but imagine, imagine being bound to that person. It means you're, you're attached to that person. You go everywhere together. Imagine being bound to that person that you hate the most or you can't stand that person you really don't like, there's some habit about him you don't really like or whatever, and you cannot stand that person, but what's the Word of God saying? Bind yourself to that person with peace. Are we willing to do that? See, this, these are such important lessons to learn. And, I mean, we, we, we think about it. Just remember, when the Apostle Paul wrote this, Ephesians 4, 2, 3, he wrote it as a prisoner. Sometimes we feel that hey, easy for Paul to say, you know, but you haven't seen this guy. Hey, Paul was writing it in the biggest storm of his life. No, I mean, one of the biggest storms. I mean, he has so many different storms. He was in a storm. He was in prison. He says, as a prisoner of the Lord, I write to you, bear with one another in love. Make sure you bind yourself to one another in peace. Even at that moment, he's making sure that we make peace with other people around. Why? Because Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, and the Beatitudes were reminded, right? Blessed are the troublemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. See, do we, are, are we understanding? Are we receiving this? Are we receiving the importance of making peace with one another? That peace is not just something we receive for ourselves, but peace is something we extend to the people around us. And today we must ask ourselves this important question, you know. Are we doing our best? As Scripture says, make every effort. Are all of us here making every effort to bind ourselves to the people around with peace? Are we doing that? We talk about the fruit of the Spirit. Are we being gentle? Are we being kind? Do we exercise self-control? Do we bear with one another in love? It doesn't matter what happens around. Last week, Pastor William talked about that. Do not repay evil with evil. In fact, Psalm 34 verse 14 says this, Turn from evil and do good. Seek, what? Seek peace and pursue it. Seek peace and pursue it. Don't give up on it. Chase after it. Find that peace. Make peace with the people around. I Today, I want to challenge us with this. Are we willing to make peace 
Are we willing to forgive those around us? Are we willing to ask for forgiveness? Are we willing to be those peacemakers? You know, I'm reminded of a parable that Jesus was telling. In fact, sorry, Jesus shared a parable about this wicked servant. But before that, uh, Peter had come up to him. And if you, I, I think it's in Matthew 18. Peter asked Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother who sins against me? Should I, receive, uh, uh, should I forgive him uh, uh, up to seven times? And what does Jesus say? Jesus answered this, I tell you not, not seven times, but some say, some versions say 77 times, some say 70 times, seven times. Whatever it is, Jesus was not giving us a formula, okay? Jesus was not giving, it's, it's Sunday morning, no one wants to do math right now, okay? Uh, but what Jesus was doing, he was pointing at something. It's not about, it's, it's got to be so much more. Forgiveness never ends. You keep on forgiving. Don't just put a number to it. It's going to be much more than that. And the question is this, church, are you willing to release forgiveness? No matter what that person has done. But I want to go one step further, you know. In fact, I find that maybe at the church, in the church level, where we can become professional forgivers. Why? Because we talk about forgiveness so much, right? We, we know we can diagnose our problem and say, well, this person hurt me, but I know I must release forgiveness. So we, we, we assume that by making some prayer at home, Lord, I forgive this person in Jesus' name, amen. Well, then everything is, 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 is fixed already. But sometimes our forgiveness can be cheap forgiveness. You know, you know why? I forgive that person. Anyway, it's easy to forgive that person or it's no problem forgiving that person because I'm never going to see that person for the rest of my life. This person hurt me, but I, I come to church and say, I forgive that person but I don't see him anymore. Does that really, does that really take any, any effort? I want us to go one step further. I'm, I'm not saying it's bad to forgive. In fact, we all must release forgiveness. But I'm saying this, beyond that, true forgiveness is this, I forgive that person and I will go and make peace. I will go and build a relationship with that person. Can you do that? Or not? Different, right? Forgiveness is not just coming up to the altar and say, Lord, I forgive this person. Forgiveness is, I come up, I say, I forgive that person, and I go out there, I pursue that person, and I build a relationship. God pursued us, and then He sent His Son, Jesus. He forgave us our sins, and He continued to pursue us. And even when we sin, He continues to pursue us over and over again, wanting to build a relationship. Then who are we to do anything less with the people around us? You say, yeah, I forgive that person, but I just, uh, uh, it's okay, I forgive, just don't, if you just don't see each other again for the rest of our lives, we'll be fine. No, 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 no. It says, blessed are the peacemakers. Go and make peace. I want you to think about it right now. No? That person, I'm sure we, we all have, mo most of us at least have some people or some situations we cannot make peace with. Are you willing to say, today I will leave this service I will send that person a text. I will, I will chill that person out. I will go and meet that person for lunch or, or, or whatever. Are we willing to build that relationship? But I know some of us will say, but pastor, you know, even if I want to build a relationship, that person doesn't want to, you know, but it's, it's so awkward already, that person doesn't want it. I don't care what that person thinks. I don't care whether that person hates you or not. The fact is, is are you willing to do it? Are you willing to try it? Are you willing to attempt it? If not, let's not even, then, then, then forget it. You're not willing. Go out and try. But we say, hey, that doesn't, that doesn't make sense. You say, but I already tried. I can try and make peace with that person, but that person refuses to, 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 make, to make peace. He doesn't want to restore this relationship, so forget it. Lah. You know what? That's a very worldly understanding. That's, that's how the world does it. What? Okay? I go and build a relationship with you, but you don't want, right? Don't want, don't want? Swat. Right? That's, that's how the world says it. But remember, this peace, this peace what? Transcends all understanding. If we behave just like what we, if we live in a way that is natural, that it does not require any supernatural effort, then what's, then are we Christians? What's the point of having a God who says, I will never leave you nor forsake you? Because we may have a God who never leaves us nor forsake us, but we have forsaken Him. We have left Him. We say, forget it. I'm not going to do things your way. Even if people don't want to build that relationship with you, we must go and pursue them and build that relationship. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not going to say it's fun even. But that's why it is supernatural. So those are the two things I want to share this morning. The two key aspects. I'm going to share with us a little bit more, but these two key aspects are this. Number one, there is a peace within. And number two, 
there is a peace without. This peace within is when we are not anxious, is when we are calm and collected, when we are at peace inside of us, no matter what storm we're in. This peace without is that we are always making peace with all the people around us. We live in peace with one another. But so far as we talk about these two things, they are still rather applicational. I actually want to bring us back. I want to bring us to the essence of what peace is all about. You know, as we study Galatians chapter 5, as we look at the fruit of the Spirit, the Greek word for, for, for peace there, okay, uh, it's this word, it's spelled E-I-R-E-N-E. I found two, uh, two pronunciations for that. It's either Irene or Irene. And that is basically where the word, the name Irene comes from, okay? And this name, actually, the, anyone here named Irene? The name Irene means peace. Okay, it comes from the Greek word of peace. But I know I say this, you know, whether it's Irene or, uh, or Irene, we don't understand that because we don't, we, we don't converse in that much. But there's another word for peace in the Bible which we're all very familiar with. It's not a Greek word, it's a Hebrew word. What's that word? Shalom. We know, we, we, we know that word shalom, we hear it a lot. Uh, it's very big in the Jewish culture. They greet one another, another with, with uh, shalom. Uh, maybe some of us are not so familiar with it, but I remember when, when I don't know, the, the church kind of, I don't know if it, whether it's just FCBC or the church in general, but, you know, sometime in late 80s to the, up to the mid-90s, church worship kind of went into this time of singing a lot of very Jewish-sounding uh, uh, songs. I don't remember that. You know, we sing like, when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon me, you know, I would dance like David dance, and we sing, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. You know, sound very Jewish. And there's this one song I learned as a kid. It's called Shalom. I don't have, you all know that? Shalom, my friend, shalom, my friend, shalom, shalom. God's peace be with you, God's peace be with you, shalom, shalom. We used to sing that um, uh, in church, we used to sing that in, in Sunday school. But what does that word shalom mean? We all think shalom is just peace, ah, peace. We say it in our Mandarin congregation as well, ping an, ping an, we greet one another like that. But do we understand what it means? The world understands peace as this, no? Peace is the absence of conflict, the absence of trouble. So when we greet one another, hey, shalom. When Jewish people greet one another, shalom. What do you think they're greeting? Are they greeting us? I wish that you will not have any conflict in your life. Shalom. May you not fight with the people around you. May you not be at war with your husband or your wife. That's, that, that's, that's a terrible greeting, right? Let's, let's be honest, okay? Imagine one day, I, let's, let's gather, gather, gather together, you go for a party, everything. Oh, you introduce, meet someone new. Hey, hi, how are you? Oh, oh I see you are married. No, I, I, I bless you that you will not argue with your wife today. It's just like, then if you're a person like, huh? See me like, eh? What does that mean? You know, we, it is not a nice greeting. But because the word shalom, peace, is not just the absence of conflict. That's not what shalom is all about. Let me explain to you. Shalom. Look at this de- the de- the, what the word shalom means. Shalom means this. It means completeness. It means wholeness. It means safety. It means welfare. It means peace. It means contentment. It means friendship. This is what shalom means. It's a very rich word, full of deep meanings to it. When you wish someone shalom, you're wishing all that on that person because that is the essence of peace. What is the essence of peace? Wholeness. Wholeness. Think about it. Why do we not have peace within? Because we feel incomplete. The anxiety tells us, hey, there's something that, 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 that is worrying, there's something that you're not going to have enough, or if you don't do this, you're not going to have that. There, this is, this, we're incomplete. That's why we're worried. Why do we not have peace with others? You know, there's a simple example. Why do people, you know, when someone is filled with jealousy, and Galatians 5 specifically talks about jealousy, why do we become jealous of someone? We become jealous of someone because that person has something that I want, but I don't have. That's not being complete. You don't feel complete. You don't feel whole. But we all must feel whole. And we try and find different ways. 
We try and find different ways to fill up this hole and, and fill up this gap in our lives. We try and fill, find different ways to complete ourselves. And so we find many people, they try and find peace in many different ways. Some people try and find peace by getting drunk, by sex, by drugs, by all kinds of vices, by addictions, by, I don't know, playing video games or whatever, or, or secluding themselves to the ends of the earth. We try and find peace in our own different ways. But peace is not found by doing something. There's no formula. No. You can't fabricate peace on your own. You can't do this and then this and then that and say this and make this prayer and then you have peace. It doesn't work that way. Because peace is a supernatural gift. And God knows that we are empty. There are certain empty pockets. And we need to be made whole. And so He gave us a supernatural gift. You know, I think it's amazing that we're here in Christmas season and we're talking about gifts because we say Christmas is a season of giving, right? Well, what's the greatest gift? What's the greatest gift ever? Jesus. Everyone will say Jesus. Why? Why is Jesus the greatest gift? I, I think it's fine to us to say, hey, Jesus Christ is the greatest gift, but we must go deeper, you know? Because sometimes we just touch the surface only. We say, oh, I guess I've, I've talk, spoken to people before. What's the greatest gift? Jesus. Why? Because it's Jesus, lah. That, that, that doesn't work. That's not, a, that's not how you define things. Why is Jesus, what makes Jesus the greatest gift? Well, He was given to us. And we read in John chapter 3, verses 16 to 17. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Saved from what? Saved from being empty, Saved from living a life without peace. What makes Jesus Christ the greatest gift is this. He is the gift of peace. What does is, what is, what is the prophet Isaiah call him? He is the prince of peace. God is a God of peace. The greatest gift is Jesus Christ because He is peace. And God gave him to us because God is making peace with us first. See, you know why we will always feel empty? There's always something incomplete in our lives because of what the Bible says. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have sinned. And what does the... You know, sometimes we, we think it's okay to be in sin. We think it's okay, it's a small sin, never mind. Uh, I, I, let me give me some time to work through it. Well, maybe you, need, you do need some time to work through it, but the longer you have that sin in your life, you know what happens to you? When you have sin in your life, aren't you, read James chapter 4, verse 4, okay? It says this, Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. As long as we have sin in our lives, we think, okay, I need some more time to deal with it. But if you have sin in your life, for the extra time that you, you allow that sin to be in your life, you are enemies with God. And let me say this. Someone say, wow, God is so harsh. No, no, no. God is telling us because it's, a, it's the warning that a parent will give a child. All the parents here, okay? I, I, I mean, I've, my parents, they've, they've given me warnings before. I'm sure your, your parents, you, you guys here as parents, you have scolded your kids before. You have warned them before. Okay, you see them playing with a knife. What do you do? You shout at them, don't play at the knife, or, or and you quickly grab it, whatever. You don't you don't grab, you don't you don't shout at them hoping that they will be cut by the knife, right? In fact, if they get cut by the knife, it hurts you to see your, your, your children that way. Similarly, God here, it hurts him to know that we are living as his enemies. So he sent his son Jesus to die for us. He sent his son as a peace offering. This gift of peace, Jesus, right? It's not just so, wow, all these people that are incomplete. Let me give them this gift of peace. They can all, ah, wow, I received this gift of peace. And they're so happy. They're so contented. No, he gave this gift of peace. Jesus Christ was a peace offering. He was a sacrifice and he made peace with us. Remember, we were his enemies, but through Jesus Christ, he now makes us children of God. In Christmas time, we sing this carol. Hark the herald angels sing. I hope we, 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 we allow the weight of the words to speak to us. How does the verse go? 
Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. You sing is a very happy song, right? Very, very, very fun and loving song. But those are very powerful words right there. What is this peace on earth? This peace on earth is that God and sinners have been reconciled. We're no longer enemies, but now we become children of God. And the Word of God tells us this in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 2. Therefore, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace. Listen to this. Is it peace of God? Is it peace from God? No. It is peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. You see, Jesus Christ was the gift of peace. Firstly, because God was making peace with us. And when we are at peace with God, when we are restored, that is when we can start having peace within and peace without. Maybe today we came to this service and you're thinking, you know, um, well, we think for pastor to give us some application. What do we do to, to, to have peace? You know, you come, the pastor will preach some message, you know, oh, peace, I give you three P's, you know, PPP or whatever. I give you ABCs or peace or whatever. I, I, I got no answer for him. That, I cannot tell you what to do and then you will have peace. I, there's no formula there. All I can tell you is this. Peace is a supernatural gift. If you want this gift, what do you do? You have to ask the giver. I cannot tell you to, I cannot give that to you. None of us here. And, and that's, that's what the world thinks. The world thinks we can create peace. But have we not learned from history? The more we try and come up, I, I don't know, I'm, I, I, I read somewhere someone was saying that almost all the peace treaties that have ever created have all been broken at some point in time. So funny, we try and use man, man's methods to create peace, but it never lasts because it is not a true peace, but yet we still settle for doing that. We try and find peace in our own ways. But church and friends, today I want to tell you, you cannot receive, you cannot find that peace on your own. You need to receive that gift of peace because it is a supernatural gift. And a minister by the name of Charles Brent, he says this, peace comes when there is no cloud between us and God. Peace is the consequence of forgiveness, God's removal of that which obscures His face and so breaks our union with Him. So I said, Shalom. It's about being made whole. It's about being complete. We are completed when we are in union with God. We were no longer enemies, but now God is with us. He sent His Son, Jesus, and when Jesus died on the cross and rose again, He says, I will not leave you as orphans, but I will send you a helper, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in us, and as we live filled with the Holy Spirit, and as we keep instead of the Holy Spirit, we will be a people of peace. And let me tell you, church, this world needs some peace. But not a peace in that. There's still going to be nothing around, nothing happening. But despite all that is happening, we will be the peacemakers. Despite all that is going on in our lives, we will have peace within. And today as I close this, I want to leave you with this blessing. This blessing that the Apostle Paul always mentions it in his 12 epistles in various forms. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 16, he says this, Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with all of you. Let's look at those words for a moment. May the Lord of peace, peace comes from God and God alone. He will give you peace because peace is that gift. In every single situation, at all times and in every way, you can have that peace. And he says this, we, we, I don't know whether we think just some kind of conversational um, um, thing he's saying, you know, the Lord be with all of you. You know, we go up to people and say, hey, the Lord be with you, the Lord be with you. But why does he say the Lord be with all of you? Because that is the true mark of peace. That is shalom, completeness and wholeness. Today, I believe there's some of us here, 
you've not given your life to Jesus before, but today I want to give you this opportunity. I want to give you this opportunity to receive this gift of peace. And if that's you today, I want to give you an opportunity to respond. Can we all close our eyes and bow our heads, both here and over there in Suntech City? And as you hear this message, maybe that's you. You know that in your life, you need some peace. We all know, I, I, I mean, in, in this church, we, we, we minister to so many different people who need peace. But this peace comes supernaturally. It comes not from what we can do or think. It comes from God. And with all your heads bowed and your eyes closed, even the Christians here, allow that peace to come upon you. And for those of our friends who want to respond this morning, I want to give you an opportunity to respond. In a moment's time, I'm going to lead us in a prayer. As I lead us in this prayer, I'm going to say it out loud. And this prayer is specifically designed for you to say that you want to receive Jesus into your life. You want this gift of peace. And as I pray it out loud, I want you to follow after me. Say everything I say word for word. I'm going to say it line by line. You follow after me line by line. Christians, pray along with me as well so that we can pray together in unity. I'm still going to pray right now. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, Dear, Dear Heavenly, Heavenly Father, Father, thank you for your great love. Thank, thank you for, for your great, great love. love. That while we were enemies, that while we were enemies, you would make peace with us. You would make peace with us. Thank you for sending your son Jesus. Thank you for sending your son Jesus as a gift of peace. As a gift of peace. And as a peace offering. And as a peace offering. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. Today, I open up my heart to you. I open up my heart to you. Come and be my Lord and Savior. Come and be my Lord and Savior. I want to follow you. I want to follow you. I receive your gift of peace. I receive your gift of peace. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank, Thank you, Lord, Lord Jesus. Jesus. With all our heads bowed and our eyes still closed, I believe some of us here pray this prayer for the first time this morning. And if that's you, here's what I'm going to do. In a moment's time, I'm going to count to three. And the moment I say three, if you pray this prayer for the first time this morning, I want you to lift your hand straight up wherever you are. And by lifting your hand up, you're saying, Pastor, I pray along with you. And I want you to lift up your hands because I want to know who you are and where you are so that I can speak a word of blessing over you. Maybe you didn't pray it out loud. Maybe you were quietly praying along. Or maybe you didn't do anything, but right now you know you want to and you need to make this decision. Well, at the count of three, you lift your hand straight up wherever you are. I'm going to count to three right now. All over this place. Don't let this opportunity pass you by. Over there in Suntech as well. You may feel confused. You may not be, you, you may feel like you don't understand everything. But again, this peace is something that transcends all understanding. You've tried enough doing things your way, but you know what? There is a greater way, there is a higher way. Today, why don't you commit to that? I'm going to count to three right now. Why don't you lift your hand straight up? One, two, and three. Just lift your hand straight up, wherever you are. Yes, I see your hands over here. Yes, a few hands over here in Touch Centre. Over there in Suntech as well. Up in the balcony. Yes, I can see your hand all the way up there. Keep it lifted up. Yes, over there at Suntech as well. I can see your hand. Keep it lifted up. Just keep it lifted up a while longer. Is there anyone else? Don't let this opportunity pass you by. With hands lifted up right now, I want to speak a word of blessing over you. Lord, I thank you for every single one of these hands that have been lifted up because every hand represents a life and a soul. Lord, today I ask in the name of Jesus that this peace that transcends all understanding will come and guard their hearts and their minds. Lord, come and fill them afresh. I ask that, Lord, from this day forth, no matter what storms there are in their lives, Lord, they will know that they can find peace in you. I bless them. I ask that all your blessings will be upon them. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. You can put your hands down. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Can I invite all of us to stand over here and over there at Suntech? I'm so thankful to see a number of hands that were lifted up both here and over there at Suntech. Here's what I'm going to do. In a moment's time, I'm going to count the three again. And this time, when I count the three, I want to invite all those of you who lifted up your hands. Could you grab your belongings and make your way to the front over here and over there at Suntech as well? Okay, it's all right. You're not going to come out here alone. The friend or the whole group of friends who brought you, they'll come up with you. We want to bring you forward because we want to get the whole church to pray for you. And we believe that as you make this public step, this public declaration, you're going to receive the, the greatest gift of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to be blessed by Him. And sometimes, you know, for us, we just need to 
seal that decision in ourselves and say, Lord, I want to do this. I want to make this decision. So you make your way down and maybe some of you, you didn't lift up your hands, but right now you want to respond. Tell your friends and they'll be happy to come down with you. And FCBC members, if you brought a friend, just turn to them and say, would you like to respond? I'll be happy to go out with you, all right? So I'm going to count to three. You make your way out. Even if you pray this prayer at a cell group or a personal setting this week, but you've not made this public declaration, come and make your way down as well. I'm going to count to three and church, let's welcome them, all right? Ready? One, two, and three. Come on, grab your stuff. Make your way down. Church, let's thank the Lord for their lives over here and over there at Sun Tank. You come on down. Don't let this opportunity pass you by. Today, we want to thank the Lord for you. We want to pray for you. We want to bless you in the name of Jesus. Let's make your way down. All those at the balcony will wait for you as well. Over there at Suntech. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, just look at me for a moment. I know it's over there at Suntech. I know you can see me through the screen. Well, today as you come up here, I don't know what your understanding of Christianity is or what it is about Jesus. And sometimes people are just understanding that, you know, Christians want to like, con you to come to church and we tell you to come to church and everything will be perfect in your life well this whole sermon is this that life will not be perfect but despite the imperfections of life we can find peace and we brought you forward because we want the whole church to pray a prayer of blessing for your own big family and I'll tell you this you know like what Jesus said in this world we will have trouble I, I look out to our congregation here and I've had the privilege of ministering to many of us I know many different struggles we have here we look around here, we have people who come from broken families. I know of husbands who have lost their wives, wives who have lost their husbands, parents who have lost their children, children who have lost their parents. You know, I, I, I shared this last night. I've, for a few years, I ministered to our teenagers, our teenagers' ministry here in FCBC. You know, it's, it's one of, it's a lot of joy there, but one of my most painful experiences is this, you know. I've actually, I've actually buried more of our teenagers than I care to count. Teenagers under my charge, much younger than me, half my age, that have passed away. But it breaks my heart. But when I go there and I meet these families, they stand strong and they stand tall. Sure, it hurts. But then they, they, they speak with such peace and such conviction that, you know what? I look at that and all I can say is this, it doesn't make sense. Well, that's correct. Because this peace transcends all understanding. No matter how tough life gets, no matter all the trouble, no matter how big the storm is, we can smile at it. Not because we're weird, but because we have this confidence, we have this hope that comes in the Lord. And today I want to tell you that as you make this decision, you have this same hope, you have this same peace. I'm not going to promise you that your life will be free from trouble. I'll promise you this, you can find peace in every storm. Because the Lord's blessing for you, the Lord's promise for you is this, He will never leave you, He will never forsake you. I'll bless you with this one thing and I'll pray for you. Remember this. Peace is not the absence of trouble. Peace is the presence of God. That's all you need. And so I want to invite all of you here, close your eyes and bow your heads. And church, can we stretch our hands towards them and over there at Suntech and let's speak a word of blessing. Lord, we thank you for all our friends who have responded this morning. That Lord, today, no matter how tough things may get in their life, no matter how big the storms are, they will always know that they have peace, they have shalom, they have you, Jehovah Shalom. Today I speak over each and every one of you that the Prince of Peace is in your lives, that you do not need to be anxious, you do not need to, be, to worry about anything, but this peace that transcends all understandings will guard your hearts and your minds all the days of your lives. I bless you with this. I ask that the Lord will bless you in all that you do, in your studies, in your work, in your relationships, with your friends and family, when He bless your health. And in the name of Jesus, I declare... Not only will you receive this peace, but you will be a peacemaker. You will be a child of God. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray for you. Amen. Amen. Can we just praise the Lord? And all of you, so good to see all of you. Just turn around and follow our pastor over there. He's going to bring you to a room outside. We want to spend some time with you over there at Suntech as well. And church, can we thank the Lord for them? Can we just praise God for all their lives? Hallelujah.
அது ப்ரைஸ் காட் you know today as we close off this service i definitely want to give us a time of of responding to the lord I've got a lot of words from the intercessors here but basically is this i think the two things if we talk about peace within and peace without some of us we can't find that that peace that inner peace today the lord wants to give you that peace and i just can't i don't know how to say it, but it's just sometimes we sometimes we like to to overthink things I know my dad likes to say this, we are educated beyond our own intelligence. And we try to come up and we must say, well, what must I do for all this? But sometimes when you come like a child just receiving a gift. When it, we talk about a childlike heart. Just think about it, now it's Christmas, right? I don't know about you, you know, but when, I remember when I was, I don't know, four or five years old and, and uh, my mom bought me this big present. And you know, you're so eager to receive that present. Every day you go, I went, went to the Christmas tree, try and, you know, look for the wrapper, which part is a bit thin, you can kind of see through, try and guess what you're having. And this is a big box, remember? It's wrapped up, I can't see what's inside, but I'll grab it and I'll kind of just walk around the house with it because it's an excitement. And on Christmas Day, what happens? Well, I wake up early in the morning, you run down, you just tear out the wrapper and you take this gift and it's my gift. <laughs> Some of us, we need to come back with that same heart of a child. You say, Lord, I need that, I need that peace. Something's been robbing you of that peace. Today, come and commit that situation to your, into that Lord's hands and say, Lord, I want to focus on you. I want to receive this gift of peace. Some of us here, we are not at peace with the people around. We have, we, we, some of us, maybe it's not directly related to you, but in your family or in your workplace, there are broken relationships. Today, why don't you come and commit those things and pray, intercede for those things because blessed are the peacemakers. Maybe you can't be the one to pull the two parties together, but you know what? You are a disciple of Christ in your office or in your family, you can, be, you can start by interceding. Some of you, maybe you have broken relationships. Maybe you need to release forgiveness. Maybe you need to ask for forgiveness. Maybe you need to go and say, I'm, I'm going to build this relationship up again. Well, today, maybe you need the strength and the courage of the Lord to say, I'm going to do that. There's some words here. Someone here, you're struggling with loneliness. It's robbing you of that peace. The Lord wants to, 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 to come and minister to you. The Lord reminds us to come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest, or I will give you peace. I will give you that shalom. And there's a word. I, I love this word. I just released it the other week. The Lord says in Isaiah 43, verse 2, When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. Peace will be given to those who go through trials. When you're going through those trials, the Lord will help you find that peace. There are some of us here, this word, I just said it, some of us harbour unforgiveness. You need to come and release forgiveness. Another word here, unforgiveness. We need to release forgiveness. There's someone here, you're at a crossroad of whether to accept Jesus Christ into your life or not. God says, do not shortchange yourself. Jesus is at the door knocking. He says, why don't you open that door and welcome him in. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the Lord says, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Today, some of us, we are troubled by the things around us, by our work, by deadlines. Uh, and some of us, we are hurting because of things that, are, that have happened. You know what? Very often, these things happen to us and they cause us to stumble. But the Lord's word is this, continue to walk blamelessly. How do you walk blamelessly? You need to receive His peace. You need to make peace with all these situations. So we're going to worship the Lord. And I just feel this last thing. Some of us, I don't know what this means, but I just feel led, led to, to release this. Some of you, you just need to experience peace. You don't, I don't know what that means, but you just need to experience peace. Why don't you come up? We're going to pray for you. And as you worship the Lord, I believe this peace of the Lord is here. So, Junyan, lead us in this song. And let's all worship the Lord. And as we sing, if you need to respond, the altar is open. You know, I just want to share this last verse with you. In Isaiah chapter 26, verses 3 to 4, the Lord says this to us, You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Number four, trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord, the Lord Himself, or Yahweh, is the rock eternal. I want to bless you with this, that we will always trust in the Lord. Very often, the reason why we don't have peace is because we trust in ourselves, we trust in our own methods, or worse, we look to the storm 
And we trust the storm more than we trust God. We trust that the storm will destroy us. But today we need to set our minds. You know, Philip, uh, just now what we read, it says, do not be anxious about anything. But it says, the peace that transcends all understandings will guard, what? Your mind and your heart. That's important. And so today as we close, I want to encourage us to do this. If you're still being prayed for, continue to be prayed for. But the Lord says, blessed are the peacemakers. Peace is not meant for us in isolation. Can I invite us, can you turn to someone beside you and can you speak a word of blessing over that person? doesn't matter whether you know that person or not, if, you, if there's an odd number, group of three, but when you come and pray for that person, release, release the gift of peace over that person. Alright, and wherever you are, go and find someone, maybe you need to go to the next pew or whatever, but just find someone, even those on duty, find someone around you, just pray for that person, speak the Lord's peace, declare Shalom over that person. Wholeness, completeness, peace, blessing, welfare, restoration, friendship, contentment. Bless them with that. Hallelujah. I declare what Jesus says to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Today I bless all of you to receive this gift of peace this peace that restores and this peace that makes you whole. I bless all of you with this, that whatever you're going through right now, no matter how big that storm is, you will find that peace. I bless you that no matter how broken that relationship is, through the strength and courage of the Lord, you will make, you will be that peacemaker and you will bring about the peace that the Lord has given to you. So I set all of you apart. I pray that we will be a faith community that brings peace to those around us. So I bless you with this in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen. Hallelujah. God bless you. You're dismissed. If you're still being prayed for, continue to be ministered to. The rest of you, God bless you.